Welcome back to Communication and Coffee. I am Professor Kylie Becker of Eastern Arizona College. It's good to see you guys again. Um, what we're going to talk about for this video is public speaking, uh, chapter five from our textbook, which is audience analysis. So let's go ahead and get started. So, okay, so an audience. So, what is an audience analysis and why are they important? Well, in regards to public speaking, your audience is pretty much your most important thing. Um, they've come to hear what you have to say, so you need to kind of be aware of some of the things about them so that you can tailor your speech specifically towards your audience. So some things to keep in mind that we'll talk a little bit more about later are demographics. So what is the age of your audience? What's their income level? What's their education level? What's their ethnicity, their occupation, their sex or their gender, and their religion? What are their beliefs, values, and attitudes towards the topic that you may be talking about? Okay. Some people might say, well, if they came to listen to me, why should I care about them? Because, you know, they're here for me, right? Yeah. You need to build common ground with your audience because you want them to want to listen to you. You want them to like you so they're more likely to take what you say and believe it or implement these changes that you may be advocating for if it's a persuasive speech. You've created a responsibility to each other um, by entering into this contract um, that is you know, public speaking. So you have a responsibility to not waste their time to get them the information that they need and they have created a responsibility to be an ethical listener and be respectful. So how do you actually do an audience analysis? Well, there's three different approaches that you can take. You can do direct observation, which is the most simple. You just kind of examine, look over your audience. You use your five basic senses to kind of get a sense of who they are. You know, and you can even just go up and talk to them, kind of get to know them. So an example of this would be, you know, the first time I walk into my classroom on the first day of school, I can look out at my students and I can say, okay, you know, maybe, you know, I have some classes that are about 75% female. Most are between the ages of 18 and 22 because I work at a community college. Um, the particular area that I am is relatively conservative. So I can say, okay, most of the students here are probably on the more conservative end of the spectrum. You know, what, and what else can I just tell by knowing where I am and just looking at the people who are in front of me? And I can use those things, the class makeup, to kind of see how I'm going to structure my first lecture, my first introduction. You can do analysis by inference, which is just using critical thinking to kind of draw a logical conclusion based on the evidence that you have seen before you. So if I have a lot of students come in who are wearing CTR rings, I know that I have a large percentage of students in my class who are LDS. If I have a large percentage of students come in who are um, with Southern accents, I know then I have a large percentage of my students who are then on one of the sports teams. And you can also do data collection which, you know, you just ask people about themselves, um, typically through th surveys or other statistical tools. So this is the type we use in my class. I have a sheet of paper that I hand out and it says, you know, what's your topic? What's your purpose statement? Um, and then some other little questions like, you know, how much interest do you have in this topic for the audience to fill out? And they say, you know, very high interest, very low interest, or medium. You know, what's your knowledge level? How knowledgeable are you about this topic? High, low? And then where did you get this information from? Is this something from personal experience? Is this something you've researched before? Where did you come by this information? So that the students can kind of get a view of where their peers are at. Um, there's five categories of it. And you can do any of these five categories within any of the three um, approaches. So you have situational, demographic, psychological, multicultural, and interest in knowledge. And the one I typically do with my class is that interest in knowledge. 
So how much do you care about this topic and how much do you know about it? So situational, looking at, okay, what is the purpose of why we've gathered? Why are we here? And is my audience voluntary or are they captive? Are they here because they really want to or are they here because this is class and they have to be, right? Because um, that'll kind of tell you if you can be a little more lax with your speeches or if you really need to keep it more structured. Demographic, so like that age, um, that income, that occupation. So who are they? What does this mean for how I'm gonna go about giving my speech? Because if I want to give a speech on saving money for retirement, I'm going to structure it very differently if I'm talking to 22-year-old college students who have a lot of time to save, or if I'm talking to a group of you know, 55-year-old investment bankers. I'm going to talk about very different things, even if it's under the same topic or umbrella. Um, psychological. So where does your audience stand on a particular issue? And within here, you have beliefs, attitudes, and values. So beliefs are our principles or assumptions about, about the universe. Our attitudes, our disposition toward a person, object, event, or idea. Are we for or against something? Are we pro or anti? Insert whatever here. And then our values are our guiding beliefs that help regulate our attitudes. Um, and here's a, examples of those. So. An example of a belief would be, you know, the world was created by, insert whatever you want here, God, flying spaghetti monster, Cthulhu, whatever. A belief, smoking causes cancer, evolution is fact or evolution is victim, um, only high risk groups acquire, insert whatever illness here. An attitude would be, you know, like I said, for or against, pro or anti-war, um, pro or anti-gambling, outsourcing, welfare, insert like I said, whatever here. And then values are more broad. So maybe you've put a high value on family or freedom or intelligence or power or tradition or generosity or independence. And you kind of have to take those into account. Like it's really hard to just walk up to ask someone and say, you know, what's, you know, give me an example of five of your values. Because put on the spot, people kind of are like, uh, wait, what do I value? but you can kind of get to see some of them by getting to know people. But if you ask them for their attitude on gambling, then people will be pretty easy to say, Hey, yeah, I'm for gambling. I should, I think people should be able to do whatever they want or no, I don't think gambling's okay because it's, you know, highly addictive or whatever. Um, our last two categories are multicultural. So just kind of realized that everyone in the audience will have a different perspective based on the culture they were raised in, whether this be like culture as an overarching group of they're from a different nation or even just household cultures, which can vary uh, widely even within a country. Um, so you need to have the ability to interact with a diverse group of people, people from all over the world. Um, and some things to keep into, like keep in your mind when thinking about this one is language. Do you speak the same language? If not, how can you communicate? Um, cognition, so different ways of thinking. How do people think and see the world? Their values, different cultures value different things. So American culture, we typically say that we value freedom very highly. Uh, we value individualism and independence, but other cultures don't value those things quite as much. Um, different communication styles, so like low context, high context. Um, if you stick around for my videos on intercultural communication or even introduction to human communication and interpersonal calm, we'll talk about those. And then ethnocentrism or ethnocentricity. So, you know, are there people in your audience who believe that their culture is above and beyond the best and none can compare and all other cultures are less than? because that's something you have to kind of take into account sometimes. And like I said, interest and knowledge, how much do they know about your topic? How interesting do they find it? And your goal is to have a group of people who have low knowledge of your topic, but really high interest, because then you have a chance to educate them and make it entertaining. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, 
leave them down in the comments section and I will get around to them as soon as I can. So have a wonderful rest of your day.